businesses that, okay, go ahead. So, yeah, just, just, just like, cause I mean, you're presupposing oppression there and I, I don't agree that any oppression is taking part, um, taking place there, which is why I wanted you to define oppression because okay. then I know how you personally, uh, envisage it. So I guess oppression for me, there's two forms. There's the legal status, which is important. Is someone bigger Mm -hmm. and on the books denying you rights and um, an ability to live the life you want? And then why are they doing that? The why is the key to all my philosophy in life. Why are they doing it? Is there a legit, logical, and efficient reason they are denying you the right to do something? And I think in a lot of cases, we do, right? We wear seatbelts. We don't fuck children. We shouldn't, at least, even though there's 250,000 child brides in the United States through legal loopholes. So that kind of stuff makes a difference. Socially, I think there's oppression through classism, obviously. And I think that plays a huge role. And then racism is something that has trickled down from our past. So that's pretty, you know, that's there. I don't think these things are without, I don't think you can have a society without these things. What I think the left is asking for, what I think they should be asking for at least is not, you know, equal opportunity, not equal outcome, because that's ridiculous. But we're asking for is opportunity in a legal and representative sense. We're asking for an acknowledgement that the past was hard and difficult and rooted in racism and systematic oppression. And what we're asking is, hey, we need to change the system. Because listen, Carl, if we believe in individuals and these individuals say, hey, the system is not quite working for me then we should say, oh, you should you should change the system to work for you. What, what, what did you have in mind? And then if they give us ideas that maybe don't quite work efficiently, we should be able to counter with logic and fact to say, okay, well, here's a better solution, but I really acknowledge you as an individual, and I'm sorry you're struggling. Maybe this is a good compromise. I don't belittle people. I don't use certain language. I make sure that I understand, as an atheist especially, living in a society that is primarily religious people, I'm dealing with non-truth constantly. So my issue is that we are dealing dealing with objective truth, subjective truth, and we don't live in a world where the two aren't one. So at least not in okay. America. I can't speak for anyone else. Okay, but I, so I can't get past the definition. Yeah, at the moment, I can't get past the definition of oppression because the way you've just defined it is so, someone... I'm sorry? I don't, could you share yours so I'm on the same page? Well, yeah, I, I, I will do, but I just want to talk about yours a bit more just because... I, I find what I find what you're laying out very interesting because if you saying someone preventing you from living the life you want to live, I mean, if the life I want to live is owning a yacht and sailing around the world, then the person who has the yacht that I can't afford to buy is preventing me from living the life I want to live. Therefore, by that definition, they would be oppressing me. But I don't think that by anyone else's definition, that would be considered oppression. So I, I think that the definition you're using is remarkably broad. I mean, the the standard English definition of oppression is um, cruel or unjust treatment over a prolonged period of time. And I think by that definition, very few things in Western society are actually oppression. And I think that's what, I mean, that's the world I perceive. And I think it's the world that most people out of intersectionality outside of that, that's how they perceive it as well. That is, that is interesting, and that's definitely a food for thought. I, I would love to explore that more, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to hijack the whole live show just talking about that, but that is so interesting to me, and I think that's where the disconnect lies. If we can't even define oppression, then how will we move forward? So usually what I like to do is I am an individual absolutist, which means I want to hear every single individual case. If individuals exist, if I want to represent them in my county or city or whatever, then I don't care what category you fall into. What I care about is what is your story? How do you function within society? How do you want to function in society? And how does society have to change to allow you to function that way? So oppression could fall into a multitude of categories. And I guess maybe I do struggle a little bit with figuring out how to eradicate oppression if if it is such a broad term, but I don't know that we're going to at all anyways. I would like to mitigate it legally if possible, and then go beyond that socially. Like, you know how Jordan, Dr. Jordan Peterson always says, I don't want to make polyamory illegal. I know about this because I'm an educator in polyamory. Okay, so he says he doesn't want to make it illegal, but he would like society to make the decision to encourage monogamy. That's the same way that I want the world to function, only in the opposite regard, which is everyone's an individual. So if you want to be polyamorous or monogamous, you should do that. So I want it to be a societal shift if the government already has made it so we are legal and on the same playing field. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And in my country, I, I don't know about the United States, obviously, because I'm not from, the America, uh, from, from, I'm not from America. But in my country, I, I would have a very hard time finding any laws or statutes or something like that 
that would be something you could describe as discriminatory towards a certain group? Well, sodomy is still illegal in some states. So wouldn't you say that was discrimination until it's off the books, even if it's not enforced? Okay, but I mean, like, like, like I said, I mean, I would be opposed to anti-sodomy laws, for example. Right, uh, but they have to be taken. So we have to take them off the books, though, so we can actually say we've reached that yeah. point. But they're still on the books. Sure, sure. So but we I mean, need to finish. Yeah, I mean, that's not my decision to make for these people. Though. I mean, I, I'm certainly going to advocate that they shouldn't have sodomy laws. I mean, I. Even even not necessarily being concerned about oppressed groups who want to perform sodomy on one another, I am amazed that anyone would be happy with that kind of level of government intrusion into their lives. I don't think the government should be regulating my sex life, assuming it's happening between two consenting adults. Yes, of course. No, so we agree on this. Regardless so, of I, the I, I, so I think what the what the left the the. I don't know if I want to say that on a live show, but um, (laughs) the people who haven't yet maybe um, finished their teens, um, they get really enthused about things they read and they feel like it makes a lot of sense. And it it does make to an extent sense, but the why and the action they take afterwards are not efficient or productive. And I think we can agree on that for the most part. So one of the ways that I've tried to help them understand a little bit better is to give examples like the sodomy law. It's not really enforced, but it is on the books, which means the government still oppresses people's sexual personal interactions as adults, regardless of consensuality, because well, not, somebody if it, if it's not enforced, if it's not enforced, but it can be. That that, but it can be. Yeah, it can be. So, uh, not, then it's not. Can I give you? So let me give you a little bit of a different example. If this is more helpful, because it's actually oh. happening. So I lived in Seattle for five years, and Seattle, Seattle specifically, is a technically nude friendly city technically the reason it's technically is they still have on the books that it could be a misdemeanor if you upset the public but the reason they have that in the books is to protect the citizens from that occasional person but in general it's a pretty pro nude city now not everyone knows that if you haven't lived there you might not know that you don't see it often it's really cold the point is even though people can technically do it they also technically can't and so what i'm trying to decide is do we want Do we want it to be on the books? Does it need to be on the books? I would argue it might protect citizens over not protecting them. But how would a sodomy law on the books protect people, right? So that's all I'm saying is that you can't say the government is allowing you things if it's literally, if somebody at one point can take me to court and say it's legal for them to do so. So I want to eradicate all laws that do things that really counter personal individual existence. Does that make sense? And then we have basic laws like do no harm. People need to be consenting. People should be adults. We have those laws in place. Those are good laws. I would maintain that in a civil society. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. But um, okay, okay, so the, the the nude law that's an interesting one. Um, yeah. Why should why should people be allowed to wander around in public naked? Well, it's not a matter of should they. It's just the community in Seattle is pro-nude. They have a lot of nudist colonies. They celebrate the solstice. So they all get together, family, friends, kids. It's very family friendly. And there's a parade and float and people throughout the year can be naked in the lakes. So it's one of those things where the community as a whole loves it. And they haven't voted against it, but no one's bothered to to challenge any laws on the books either because they haven't had to. But that doesn't mean that someone eventually can't use that against the people of Seattle. Does that make better sense? Yeah, no, no, that that makes sense. Um, so, if the community was anti-nude, uh, would you be opposed to that? Would you want them to change? I think that it makes perfect and solid sense to have designated nude areas. I am a pro, I'm clothing indifferent, so I've been naked lots of times in public. But one of my things is that I would like to do it in a space that isn't traumatizing to other people. So, you know what I mean? So if it's allowed, it's allowed. But if it's not allowed, then great. Where is it allowed? And maybe I can advocate for myself to have it more allowed in certain spaces. But I think that's a nice compromise. Yeah, I think that's a fine compromise. Yeah. Cool. Um, should we should we get back to discussing the sort of ins and outs of intersectionality? Sure, so let's I find do that. It very interesting because intersectionality, um, from from what I I see of it, it looks like a a way of systematically categorizing every human being on Earth uh, to the point where it becomes prescriptive and it becomes dogmatic and authoritarian and overbearing. I'm not accusing you of these things, but I'm sure that you know that there are plenty of people who do interpret it in this manner, and yes. this is a problem. I, I think this antithetical yes. to a free society. Um, 
Yes. Why do you consider yourself an, a sort of an intersectionalist if you see these problems coming out of it? I'd like to think that the reason I fell in love with intersectionality was because of Kimberly Crenshaw. I think her ideas of, of feminism and womanism and the concepts of what it means to acknowledge these things is important. I think the, the most fascinating thing about being a human is first being able to say, ah, oh, these things are happening or they're not happening, and then to move forward appropriately. I always hear from people in the United States, I'm not, again, sure how it's done in the UK, but I always hear from the people, mm. Christianity is under attack. There is a, there are organizations trying to tear us down. And I'm sitting here thinking, well, is there though? Is there oppression towards Christianity? And as an atheist, I want to promote your individual rights, so how can I help you? But then you know, it's case by case. So the baker was a great example. Christians thought it was a win. I thought it was a win for an individual, like a business owner and an artist. So and my thing is, intersect- is under attack, isn't it? I mean, you, when they say Christianity From- is under attack, what they mean, what they mean is as a hegemonic cultural force, Christianity is under attack. And it absolutely is. And it okay. should be. So, I'm, a, I'm an anti-theist. So we, so, like I, so I would be attacking acknowledge- Christianity if it was in my life. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would be, if, if I was living in like a Southern American state, I would be a far more militant anti-theist than I am personally. I mean, in my country, 51% of the country is irreligious. Uh, it, it's, yeah. it's deeply embarrassing when someone tells you about their religion in this country. Um, so it's not a problem. It's, you know, th- there's, there's no sort of creeping theocracy outside of Islam in my country. Um, but in, in the Southern states, I could see why creeping theocracy is a definite problem. And so when they say Christianity is under attack, I mean, why would we say it's not? Okay, so, well, what I would personally do is I would say, okay, you're under attack. In what ways are we under attack, and in what ways can we help you as individuals? Um, and then I would do that with every group. So if we can agree that Christians can be oppressed, then we can agree that other classes of people can be oppressed, right? So that we acknowledge that. To move forward, well, I need Any, any individual it. can be oppressed. Any, any person can be oppressed, yeah. But but collective thoughts can also be a targeted um, a targeted group. You know, as an atheist, I am <laughs> I try not to be militant about it because I do believe individuals should have the right to believe in invisible creatures. But I also do believe that they need to acknowledge that that's how I view it, and so they need to learn to live with me. So Christians might be under attack to an extent, but as an atheist. Mm-hmm. All I, all I know of them is in power. Example, you can't have a non-Christian president, right? Not yet. Mm-hmm. Maybe one day, if we're lucky. We had Kennedy, and that went, well, fabulously, as we all remember. So I would like there to be a moment in time where the United States does represent other religions and doesn't say we're a Christian nation, because we still say that, even though we're a secular nation. And so these types of things tell me Christians are in power. If you can have a cake bake, if the baking issue is like, your most prominent issue as a Christian in the United States, then maybe we can talk about that. If you're talking about around the world, Iraq, I'm a Chaldean. Like we, we are the Catholics. We are the Christians of the, the Iraq. If we're talking about that oppression, let's talk about that oppression. But in the United States, Christians as a whole saying they are oppressed. I would like to see the data. And then I would like to help them with that data. The same I would like to do with well, any yeah. other group that came to me. As long as they're not yeah, harming I don't people. Agree that, yeah. I don't agree that Christians are oppressed, but, um, we're not talking about what, what, what you're talking about is the dominant hegemonic culture that is predominantly Christian. And that is mm-hmm. definitely under attack by, uh, well, it was under attack by an organized atheist, anti theist movement, which had legitimate cause. That it was, I mean, mm-hmm. like you said, there are anti sodomy laws still on the books. So it was completely justified, in my opinion, and completely right. But Christians can then legitimately say Christianity is under attack because it is. That was the point. <laughs> but the, well, it, uh, that's not to say that they're automatically oppressed. Okay. So let's think about this that. Is, okay, okay, so the, yeah, yeah. See, th- this, is, this is the problem, because in my opinion with social justice, it comes inherent, it, it can't think outside of the dichotomy of oppressed and oppressor. It can't operate without that. It's one, one majority group has to be the oppressor of another minority group. That has to be the way. And it can't ever envisage a minority group oppressing a majority group, even though that's happen- that happens all the time. So it's really peculiar to me that it, like, it's, it's a worldview that doesn't really accurately represent human interaction. And then it seeks to categorize and um, sort of formalize every individual, or at least the characteristics about a person that it has a particular interest in. I mean, it, it never wants to talk about, I don't know, whether blue-eyed people are more privileged than brown-eyed people, you know, things like this. You know, well, actually, brown-eyed people are more privileged than... 
Well, blue eyed people actually. If